Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm a journalist, reporter and editor. So I will try to present um, a view from my perspective, from my own subject about Zika, you, uh, the Zika virus and during the epidemic year. Uh, I really would like to share, uh, to thank this opportunity to be here. Uh, it's always a way for me to present Brazil beyond cliches. And I think uh, I crossed the Atlantic with a mission with that we are now facing a very huge crisis, political crisis, economic crisis. And maybe this is a very uh, important subject. Um, I will... Oops. Um, I, I quoted Robert Fisk, uh, British journalist, because I, and he's a war reporting, uh, award-winning reporter from Independent. I don't know whether he works there anymore, but um, he, he, he somehow established the link between making history and our commitment with truth. Um, no matter what. And uh, I think for me, as a journalist and as a Brazilian, uh, the epidemic, the Zika epidemic, really touched me in the sense that what is my role in society? Uh, so this quote means, uh, please, as journalists, you have the duty to make history and to look upon the questions that are the society now need to look at. Um, I will show you three uh, pictures that is, is nothing to do with Zika, but it somehow gives you a, a sign what is facing now Brazil. Uh, this is from um, British magazine Economist, and uh, just <coughs> remind us the current uh, view uh, for for outside world of Brazil. I mean, over the last five years, six, ten years the picture has changed a lot uh, from a very sort of positive outcome to the downhill. So that, that the atmosphere the country feels like now. Uh, this was taken uh, in 2004. Uh, 2004 means, help me, 14 years? No. 14 years old. So this picture was uh, taken by global photographers uh, near the favelas when the soldiers were taking the kids. Um, this photo appeared again because the, since February we have a military intervention in Rio and um, some fake news said that, that there was a situation but in fact it happened before many times. So it's outrageous. And this is a prison in the north of the country. Last year, I think two years ago, more than 100 people died there. And this was uh, last Sunday. Uh, I know that you must be aware that a huge fire destroyed the National Museum in Rio. Uh, lack of funding, uh, have the, 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 the one of the greatest uh, collections of, yeah, of America, a 200-year-old museum was destroyed. The most important scientific museum had been consumed by fire. 20 million items have gone. For years, expert had warned a series of problems that might take, might risk the building. During the fire, uh, they had no water, no ladders, no equipment to combat, no water. And what is the relation with Zika? Um, I, I, I think this picture just captures the problem of the country. You know there, abortion is illegal. Uh, in many rural areas, people don't have access to basic resources. They don't have contraceptions, they don't have uh, first medicals. And this woman, I think she's uh, less than 40 years old. I think she's 30 something, but she looks uh, older. With her 
her children. Um, the, the youngest one is a boy and had Zika. This photo is important because it was taken after the government suspended the outbreak, the, 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 the decree. And it was taken in Alagoas state where Deborah Diniz, a researcher in Brazil, found that there are a lot of underreported cases. So uh, even though right now Zika is a very big problem, but this, for me and, and I think globally, it seems that, that it's gone. Um, I, sh I mean, you both are, are familiar with the Zika virus. I don't have to explain that, but uh, it's 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 important to contextualize when Zika is started, when Zika with microcephaly, uh, what we call now congenital Zika syndrome, is started. Was we were in the middle of the biggest scandal in Brazil, and I remember uh, getting the first pictures. Um, uh, it was not this one here, but it was one of the first features that the Global TV had received from their uh, networks in the, regional, in the regional bureaus. And after four months, uh, the WHO issued a Zika-related public health emergency of international concern. Um, I think the idea that in this exotical scenario, a mosquito uh, did only a bite a pregnant woman to seriously jeopardize the health of her fertus, triggered the alarm. I think it was, the main question was, this time is not only an outbreak, it's an outbreak that built a narrative of human fragility and vulnerability around a central issue which is reproduction. Um, I've actually collected some uh, iconic photographs from the epidemic, uh, those from Reuters uh, uh, during the first months when, when the international media draw attention to, to the epidemic. And at that point, uh, as an editor, I realized that um, the international media outlets were pretty much worried about what is going to happen with their with the athletes, with these four people, because we are hosting the 2016 Rio Games. So six months prior to the games, uh, where uh, this new camp, this is all begin, and all this image were broadcast internationally. Um, But somehow it reminds me when I when I saw these pictures in my, in my newsroom, the Ebola outbreak with uh, you know people and um, men with uh, dressed as astronauts who to save people from the third world. Uh, but this time, not only uh, adults but children. Um, it is interesting because at the beginning I thought that uh, there was a, uh, there would be an opportunity to discuss uh, why people from Brazil and other third world countries are getting the disease. Uh, why discussing why people uh, are living in unsanitary conditions and in place in the favor of uncontrolled proliferation of mosquitoes, why? But at the first, I think the international media were really concerned about uh, this novelty and uh, this risk and uh, should we be getting this risk around here? Um, so I decided to start Zika, but before that, I, sh I should uh, play for you a five minute uh, segment that I cut some videos during the first year. Uh, that you're gonna get some kind of um, broad picture from the narrative they used. Yeah. The health organization has declared a swine flu pandemic. The virus continues to infect people. The new respiratory virus called MERS. So, killed nearly 300. 
A big outbreak of the deadly Ebola virus. Outbreak right, spread widely and cannot be monitored. A mysterious disease strikes Brazil, putting health officials on edge. When is so first baby, the second baby, and the third baby. I said, I never saw anything like this in my life. What ISIS would need to do is send a few of its sure. suicide killers uh, into an Ebola-affected zone and then get them on some mass transit somewhere where they would need to be to affect the most damage. That's what you're referring to. criticism that is being leveled is that you are using, in a way, the Zika virus and the fear about it to change the abortion laws per se that actually this is a bigger women's rights issue right now. In my case, I've never received anything. It's been more than two years and we haven't got a thing. At least these medicine is so expensive, the family's income can't cover it. They have to rely on donations from friends. Nadia nurses her around the clock, but her condition's getting worse. Half a century ago, when, when I was a child, uh, anybody who contracted rubella would be kept away from the houses of our playmates, away from any potentially pregnant women. Uh, but that, that isolation method doesn't work with Zika because, of course, the, the mosquito can fly in the window, bite the infected person, and fly out. So we can't use the same methods traditionally used against rubella. A group of concerned junior doctors takes us to see something that the Venezuelan government is either deliberately ignoring or hiding. This Zika can also be transmitted through sexual contact with infected partners. In the past 18 months, there have been 14 reported cases in the US of the virus being transmitted this way. When visitors come to Rio, they can pick up the Zika virus through mosquitoes or through sex, and then they go home, many of them to places where again there are mosquitoes or again they will have sex. And it is entirely possible for the virus to spread that way. That's how the virus got to Brazil. A single infected traveler came, and now you've got 2,000 brain damaged children. In the French Babac is maternity hospital. More than 50 cases of microcephaly have been confirmed, and the cases are still coming in, another two were confirmed. As with so many discoveries, the scientists working here nearly 70 years ago were not actually looking for the Zika virus. They were doing research on yellow fever. Shasta, you are in Brazil at what I believe is ground zero of the authorities' attempt to get a hold on this. Give me a sense of, of, of how out of control it is there. Well, Christian, it's pretty frightening. You know, in, in a normal year, uh, you only see about 140 cases of, of microcephaly, these birth defects, uh, in Brazil. And here in this city, you only see about nine. There are hundreds of them. In fact, more than a thousand cases of microcephaly. This is the bloodsucker everyone's after. The female 80s Egyptian mosquito. She and two of her sisters carry many of the deadliest diseases on the planet. And kill more people each year than any other animal, including man. A crafty predator. The Egyptian hides in her beds and cracks in your homes until she can attack and suck your blood. But not for food. She needs your blood's protein and iron to make her eggs. While her sisters feed on other animals, this vampire prefers human blood. And she likes a smorgasbord. As many as five of us can be bitten for just one yummy meal. That's why she's so good at spreading viruses. You might think she's immediately contagious like a syringe that sucks up infected blood from one place and injects it into another. But that's not so. Depending on the temperature, it actually takes between 5 and 14 days for a virus to replicate in her gut and then make its way to her salivary glands. Then she can spit it out when she bites you, along with an anti-clotting factor that makes you itch. Science is working on ways to stop this deadly progression by interrupting virus replication so she'll never become infectious or by making her sterile or damaging her offspring so that she'll become extinct. Now before you start worrying about the impact on the food chain, she's one of more than 3,000 species of mosquitoes, and scientists say that no other creature needs her for survival. So taking this nasty vampire out of existence could be part of the plan to get rid of the deadliest animal on the planet. I think this five minute segment explained what was, what were the main uh, 
narratives. Uh, uh, of course, they've changed because um, I, I decided to look, to look in a, a large period. So, uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, the Hollywood-driven the uh, narrative of CNN prevailed. You know, I think one one of these videos it won't help people. I think it would just bring more uh, global alarming. It's just like a doctor, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, saying that this is a this is a vampire, <coughs> and uh, I understand because media wants to translate sometimes. Uh, but it missed the point because it, it generates fear, and it could it could really uh, drive this coverage to a very sensationalistic uh, tone. So I decided that uh, oh, it's this one here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. So I decided that the, the main research question was what were the main frames of narratives adopted by CNN, BBC and Al Jazeera? Uh, why three of them? I think uh, because they, the three of them, they operated um, um, both in TV and radio and also uh, during the digital platform. So it would be easier for me to research. And I had this sub-question that I need really to explain more later, maybe. Did the Zika virus lose its, its editorial importance or relevance once it was no longer framed as a global risk threat? Um, I can see that the, after my, my research, I found out that the, the number of uh, stories declined sharply. Uh, after the day WHO uh, finished the decree. So we, we chose uh, some, some specific month because we, for instance, in May 2015 was the first time the Zika virus was mentioned in Brazilian media. Uh, and then November 20, uh, 2015, when the Brazilian government acknowledged the fact that there was a, an outbreak and then December, when the, the when WHO issued some alerts, and then it each, each month has a, a, a reason. So after that, we analyze seven news frame as follows: global epidemic, for instance, when when the story refers to Zika as a potential pandemic epidemic. Does the story suggest increased number of cases? Uh, second, morality. Uh, is, does the story uh, discuss hum human rights or the context of dominant religion? Does the story mention or question the efforts of international officials who are devised of war and women or couples to avoid pregnancy? Uh, does the story feature any discussion about abortions? Responsibility, uh, the lack of remand, uh, treatment resources, unreported case, discarded case, women's and children's health. Uh, does the story show a mother with a baby? Does the story show children in their homes? And the fifth frame, risk, fear, and uncertainty. Wherever the word risk appeared explicitly or the test generates insecurity, uh, and provides no information about the causes and consequences. Uh, the sixth frame, scientific progress, vaccines, new studies, findings, scientific papers, regional tragedy, uh, when we classify and code each news as a tropical disease from more than three areas. So we analyze, uh, after studying this almost two years, 211 uh, videos, um, most of them from CNN, uh, uh, we didn't use Google uh, as, a, as a research platform. We use the media outlets website. So it might be different than the numbers of if another research we would study this, they might come to another numbers. 
Um, and the conclusion was 80%, more than 80% of the videos uh, that were in the website uh, uh, talked about risk and uncertainty. Secondly, global epidemic. And it is interesting to note that responsibility was the third frame which prevailed on CNN and Al Jazeera. However, uh, BBC uh, regional tragedy prevailed on BBC. And in spite of the fact that Zika was a breakthrough for sites and families, women's and student health and scientific programs were not the most common use. I should say that scientific progress is just because at the beginning we didn't know, you guys know more than me, that uh, uh, it was everything new. Uh, and questions of morality, let's use it. I mean, I have to emphasize that there were some debates about uh, the re women's rights, but uh, it was not the, the case from CNN, for instance, or from BBC. They mentioned that, but they didn't pay much attention. Uh, as other, um, as other uh, outbreaks, uh, I think um, this outbreak followed a very classical epidemic, uh, covered, covering epidemic. Uh, it's like a ritual, you know, the first weeks of flooding uh, the public with a lot of information. Um, and Susan Waller uh, coined the term compassion fatigue uh, 20 years ago when she said that uh, the sensation of something being the same as ever was creating a self-perpetuating loop. In other words, the public loses interest as time passes and the perception of the media is that the public is no longer interested. Uh, and she concludes compassion fatigue encouraged the media to move on to the other stories. So we have this graphic with a lot of stories uh, after the WHO issued a decree and then just slowly but slowly disappeared. And in comparison with the other epidemics, I think this Zika was embodied with risk, emotional, uh, and also all the, all the, all the uh, questions re regarding human reproduction, as I said and also uh, the, the unpre unpredictability uh, uh, feeling that you don't know what, what's, go what's going on. Uh, I would cite Trudy here because we, were, we have a discussion here when we were, uh, and I was uh, starting looking at these videos, and uh, we were discussing uh, why disease of poverty became visible. And, uh, and uh, why, why we don't care about Africa or even in Brazil, I, f I found the same. Uh, I live in Rio and uh, we pretend that we're not having a war, we pretend that we, people are not uh, uh, dying with basic, you know, basic needs, they don't have anything and uh, it's just because it doesn't matter. For, for the public opinion, for the Western opinion, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not generalized, I'm saying that in terms of mediatic, mediatic speaking, uh, uh, it, 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 it doesn't really appeal that uh, here uh, people are really interested into, it's, it's as another tragic of, of the third world countries. Um, I think it's, it, it really, uh, touch in an uh, emotional as women. I think uh, I've seen a lot of videos from from uh, about mothers and sisters and the network involved with look after the student. But in general, uh, the maybe is the, the problem is the language. Uh, the mothers were less listened and the, and the, during the the coverage. Uh, I think I should emphasize here uh, the CNN coverage because they start, as I said, with a lot of sensationalism uh, stories. And they have this celebrity doctor, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, that he goes, away, he goes every, uh, everywhere. And when the, I think when the CDC in January uh, alerted that the, the, the virus 
was in the United States, uh, I think somehow the CDC took over uh, the coverage because uh, I hardly see any Brazilian uh, scientific, Brazilian scientists talking about on CNN. All of a sudden, all the specialists they 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 listened was were all American scientists. Uh, of course, uh, they they got better. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Sanjay went to Brazil. He interviewed some people, but you could see from CNN perspective that were they were really, uh, devoted to to give the voice for the American scientists. Uh, in general, I think BBC videos were very educative. The, they have a diversity of reports and location. They tried their best because they have a correspondence, on, uh, so you could see that they had the uh, correspondence in Africa, in Latin America, because Zika, uh, Zika was not only in Brazil. And uh, their approach is very, is very, was very diverse as well. They touched on a subject which is abortion. Um, they challenged local government. Uh, so did Al Jazeera, uh, but Al Jazeera, it's the English channel, uh, they have less correspondent and they have a very so small structure. So um, it's not really fair to compare because while saying it, it's a hundred videos, that Al Jazeera had fifty, more or less. So, but they were very informative and uh, and I think it's really good that they came back after two years and listen to the people and one of the, the, the mother that appeared in that video was an Al Jazeera uh, interviewee because they, they went to receive and asked what happened. Um, and CNN, as I said, uh, at the beginning was very Hollywood driven. Um, I should uh, end here uh, because we can have a discussion uh, with my uh, uh, own experience uh, in reporting Zika. I was I was very concerned about my limits. Um, uh, how, how 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 can I portray uh, a question like that without crossing the boundaries? Um, I think my first dilemma was uh, I had to face uh, this idea of neutrality associated with journalism. Uh, we were in the middle of the economic crisis and we were so worried about uh, the outcome of the new uh, government. And, and we didn't pay attention uh, when the case came, the first pictures, the first information. And of course, we had to follow a uh, editorial guide in order to avoid uh, exploitation of suffering. Um, however, we had the experience that w by hiding these diary portraits to prevent dramatizations, uh, we're heading to the opposite directions. In other words, were we heading towards uh, not talking about the outbreak? So that was the dilemma. Uh, it was like a very fine line uh, that separates the right, the journalist to report and the right of the victims. Um, uh, I actually uh, interviewed two mothers and they, were, they felt uh, abandoned. They said all the reporters, both from Brazil uh, and abroad, just left them behind and they were in the center. They were like freak creatures and now they are left behind without any treatment, money, and uh, so I don't know, it's, 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 it's always a challenge for us. Um, the other thing is, I think I noticed, uh, yeah, I mentioned also to Trudy when we were talking about, it's um, somehow, um, it was the science from the world's leading institutions found themselves under pressure to acknowledge their colleagues from the north northeastern Brazil. Uh, while these Brazilian scientists have a small presence in international publication, they had discovered, what they had discovered, it's remarkable. 
And I, I talked to many uh, researchers, and they, they also felt that uh, there was a suspicion, and it's understandable because some of the, 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 the centers were not linking to universities at all. They were, they were like bedside doctors, you know, physicians. And, and in, in one analysis of, about the Zika coverage, uh, especially on CNN, um, uh, in relation to microcephaly, uh, the Brazilian scientists were rarely mentioned. Uh, maybe it's a, a question of methodology, as I said, because I, I researched it through their websites, but out of 133 videos, most of the scientists heard were Americans, reinforcing the idea that it was somehow a cultural skepticism on everyday science that's not from Europe or the US. Um, I think not because uh, Deborah Jenny said that uh, we were discussing that, uh, that th th it happened like a, a not Iraqization of, of science because uh, not only these Northeasterns mistrusted because of their ge geographical regions, many, many were also the targets of suspicion because there were clinicians, professors, and healthcare providers lacking the un unusual scientific credentials listed in the bios published in high-impact journals. Um, one might argue that that may be a language barrier, um, but uh, I, 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 I tend to disagree with that because um, I think uh, it's just a matter of bias against the the, the production from, from the North East. I'm not talking about only the, the bias and the prejudice uh, uh, from, from here or from the US. Even though as Brazilian, the most, uh, the, most of the, the uh, scientists were in the South and the Southeast, and they were very suspicious about their college findings. Uh, uh, oops, here. Um, I have some suggestions for journalists and for, for doctors and researchers, but I would leave for, for the questions. But I would leave uh, this small talk with the Milan Kundera, uh, Czech Republic, uh, uh, former Czech Republic, Czech uh, author. Uh, in 1979, that means almost 40 years ago, uh, when he said that the bloody massacre in Bangladesh quickly covered over the memory of the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia, the assassination of a land running out the grounds of Bangladesh, the war in the Sinai desert, made people forget Alendi, the Cambodian massacre made people forget Sinai, and so on and so on, until ultimately everyone lets everything be forgotten. So what I ask in this paper is, uh, shall we keep uh, reporting this uh, terrible tragedy as the fault of the of the population or the fail of public policies. That's 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 it basically. Thank you. <laughs>